Hello, this is the Ancient History and Medieval History Lecture for Wednesday, the 2nd of December, 2020. Um, where we left things off was the Battle of Marathon. The Persians had expanded to conquer Greek Ionia. The Greeks revolted because they thought the Persians were tyrannical and oppressive. They asked Athens for help. The Athenians said, uh, we will not officially help you, but volunteers can go. And a navy and an army of volunteers go, help the Ionians burn the provincial capital of Sardis, Satrap's palace. And that gets great king Darius of Persia very angry. So Darius organizes a huge army and orders it to destroy the revolt. And they come in and they destroy the revolt and drive the Athenian volunteers back. And Darius blames Athens for interfering in his country's domestic affairs. Make sure you have an open note pack in front of you uh, and you know where we are. 490 BC. So in 490 BC, after suppressing the Ionian revolt, a massive seaborne invasion is launched, with over 50,000 uh, Persian troops landing here, or should I say here, 26 miles across the Attica Peninsula from Athens. The Persians are coming ashore on this beach with a swamp behind it. The Athenians march their army to a nearby hill to observe the Persians, and with the intent of waiting for Sparta. But Sparta's having a religious festival, and so Sparta's not coming. Miltiades, the leader of the Committee of Generals, the Ten Strategoi, these are the only elected officials in Athens, and they are chosen, elected, because war is such an unforgiving thing. You can't trust it to lock or randomness. Miltiades says, despite Sparta not being here, we need to attack now, to which uh, the other general said, that defies all logic. We should go back home like the Spartans suggested, hide behind our walls, wait for Sparta, and then when Sparta shows up, then we'll come out and fight. Miltiades well, says, you don't understand. Right now, this army is completely disorganized. No one knows where their stuff is. No one knows where their horses are. Everything is confused. And that confusion is multiplied quantum style by the fact that they are a polyglot army. Polyglot, P-O-L-Y-G-L-O-T, polyglot, P-O-L-Y-G-L-O-T, polyglot means they speak many different languages, so they can't understand one another. Polyglot. They can't understand one another. And as such, they are in complete disorder. However, if we allow them to have time without being disturbed, they'll organize. Every hour, every day, brings them closer from being a mob to being an army. Once they're an army, they'll come after us, and they're gonna, they outnumber us five to one. They'll swamp us, they'll kill us. And even, without, uh, even with our walls, without Sparta, we're toast. And even with Sparta, we may still be toast. So Miltiades convinces the strategoi of Athens, okay, we're going we're to fight now. So the strategoi say, well, the other generals, what we should do is uh, fortify the hill because we have the high ground and they'll have to come up after us. To which Miltiades says, hello, are you even in there? Are you listening? If we wait on the top of the hill, we are waiting for them to organize. If they organize, they'll overrun us. The key to fighting them now, and the reason for fighting them now, is that they are not organized. They are a dis disorganized mob. So he convinces them to give up a second piece of military logic, holding the high ground. Nope, they're going to go down the hill, and they're going to charge the Persians. Now, the Persians by this point see that the Athenians are being aggressive, and the Persian, Persian general organizes enough of his army to, that he, as far as he's concerned, crush the Greeks. 
Now, like all armies, <clears throat> the Persian general is in the center. His best troops and strongest units are in the center. His weak units are on the flanks, the left and the right. And that's what the generals expect Miltiades to do. They expect the generals, including Miltiades, to be in the center of the Athenian line, big strong center, with the weak forces on the wings, on the arms. <clears throat> to which Miltiades says, No! We're not following a rule book. This is war. We're going to have a weak center with really strong flanks, really strong wings. What we're going to do is deploy an army that looks like it's strong in the middle, but that is strong on the wings. To which the other generals say, huh? And Miltiadi says, I'll explain the plan. And he explains the plan and they go along with it. Third, military logic. You keep your strength in the middle with the generals. You have weaker wings. You fight the battle in the center. No. So here's what happens. The Persians, in red, <laughs> Advance up the middle, right towards the Greek center, like a fist. <laughs> Miltiades orders the weak center to make contact with the Persians and then immediately fall back. Remember, you can move because you're sort of obscured from seeing this. So the center retreats, but the wings close in from the sides like a fist coming around. So, the Persians advance towards the Greek center. The Greeks allow the contact to sell it. And then the center pulls back, but the fingertips, the wings, the flanks, advance around the Persians, enveloping their fist, and then cutting the head off the snake. Cutting the head off the snake. The Persians have all their strength up here by the knuckles. The Greeks have all their strength up here by their fingertips. So the snake advances. The Greeks cut the head off the snake. In the surrounded pocket of Persian troops lie their generals and their best troops. And they are now surrounded by the Athenians and cut off from the rest of their army. And they are chewed up like a piece of pizza by the Athenian army. <laughs> Gone. The rest of the Persian snake starts doing what a snake will do if you cut its head off. It starts flopping around because it doesn't know it's dead yet, but it's really kind of dead yet. It's really kind of dead. The rest of the Persian army goes into chaos and convulsions. And the Athenians then march up the beach, either driving the Persians into the swamps, where they're going to die, or driving the Persians onto the ships, which the Greeks then light on fire, or drive the Persians into the sea, and the ships get off before the Greeks can start burning them. Either way, organized Persian resistance is gone once the head is cut off the snake. Miltiades has violated three basic rules. He's fought alone without allies. He charged down the hill instead of keeping the high ground. And he had strong wings and a weak center. And all three of those things paid off. Marathon was a great victory. The Persians were defeated. However, it always a however. 
The Persians got a hold of the information about Athens. They learned that the Athenians were going to surrender if they showed up, so all they had to do is go around the Attic Peninsula with their surviving ships and men, land here, march to Athens, and Athens will surrender. And the Greeks find this out. The surviving Persian troops are aboard ship, and those ships are beginning to row and sail as fast as they can, and they will get there. The army of Athens is still cleaning up. They cannot make it back to Athens in time. Even if the army were to start marching, they wouldn't get there in time. What to do? The Athenians have just won the battle. Will they lose the war because of the surrender order of the peace party, of the doves? Well, the generals call upon an Olympic runner named Pheidippides, who is a courier in the battle, running around passing messages from one part of the Greek of uh, the Athenian army to the other. They give Pheidippides the mission: convey this message to Athens. We have won the battle. Don't surrender. It's a trick. The army will be there soon. The Persians don't have the force to take Athens. Pheidippides strips down to his birthday suit like a good Olympic runner. And he starts running and running and running the 26 miles over hill and over dale from Marathon Battlefield to Athens. Now, what's at stake? What's at stake? One man with one message. If Pheidippides doesn't get there, the Persians will bluff, Athens will surrender. Persian wars are won by the Persians. Athens becomes part of Persia, Sparta too, probably, and there's no Athenian Golden Age, there's no Pericles, there's no Parthenon. There are no great Greek playwrights. There's no Socrates. There's no Aristotle or Plato. A lot of the things we associate with basic Greek culture are never going to happen because Persia conquers the Athenians and is going to conquer Greece. Without Greece, there is no Rome that we recognize. Without Rome, there is no Western civilization. There is no Roman Judea in which Christ can be born. The Christian faith without a Roman Empire would be unrecognizable. There is no Roman Empire to fall in the West, allowing the Christian faith to become the nucleus of the new Western civilization. Ideas of freedom, philosophy, democracy, republic, military science, how you run an empire, how civilized people behave, what Christianity stands for, that all people have value, all are made in God's image, even the low class, even the scum. Everyone is beloved by God. None of these things would come together to form our Western civilization. No Charlemagne, no Middle Ages as we recognize them, no England, no 13 colonies, no United States of America. No World War II, every, every, every life on Earth would be different. The tribesmen of Papua New Guinea would not have their cargo cult based on the American and Japanese fighter planes fighting over their jungles. These are Stone Age people whose only contact with the outside world was watching aerial battles in the 1940s between what they thought were angels and demons. The deepest heart of the Brazilian jungle and the people that live there, deepest, darkest Africa, and the people would live there everywhere on Earth, and everyone on Earth would live in an alternative timeline without any recognition to our own. Because without Athens' golden age, there is no Western civilization. That's what's at stake. The entire future of the world is running with that one man. Now, there will be people in college and in life who will tell you that individuals don't matter. Oh, God, there's an entire class of college history professor. No, it's socioeconomic forces that matter. Individuals are just the poster children for the broader historical forces of class and social conflict, to which I say, baloney! Look at Phidippides. There are going to be people in your life that say you can't fight City Hall. Go along to get along. Just do what the government says. Don't think about it. Shut up and put on your mask. 
Be obedient. Be a good little drone. Because you're not powerful. Your dreams don't matter. To which I say, baloney. Pheidippides was not a nobleman. He was an Olympic runner. That's his only claim to fame, that in this room. All of this is running on him. The entire history of the world. And this is one of many cases that I will tell you about where one individual's choice changes the history of all of humanity everywhere on earth. Pheidippides is one example. But he doesn't know this. He's running. I used to be a cross-country runner, runner back when dinosaurs ruled the world. He's running. Pheidippides is running. Yeah, after a while, you get into the groove. You skate over and skim over the, the, the land like you're floating, like you're levitating. You're just Your body is a machine. You run, you breathe, you run, you breathe. Uphill, downhill. And then, after the tenth mile or so, it gets hard. Your body is telling you, STOP! Your heart, your muscles, your joints ache. You are fatigued beyond belief. You still run, 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 run. Your will forces you on to run. What is Pheidippides fear? He doesn't know about the history of the Western world or the planet Earth. He fears dying. His heart is telling him to stop this. His lungs are on fire. Stop this. His body is telling him, you're going past our tolerance zone. Stop this. He's afraid of dying before he gets the message there. He dies. Athens surrenders. His land is done. And he's died. So he is, he's dead. He doesn't want to die. But he doesn't want his city to fall. That's all he needs. What does he hope for? He hopes he's going to run. He's going to pass the message along. He's going to be a hero. He'll have saved Athens. Wine, women, and song. Woo! Triumph and the fruits of victory. That's what he hopes. What does he get? As his body screams, he does not stop. He keeps running. You may ask me, how, Mr. Genario, can you know that a man who's running alone over 26 miles of hilly, rocky Greece uh, doesn't stop well, because of what happened? This is how I know. He keeps running until when he arrives, he comes over the last hill. He's within shouting distance of the walls. The Persians have already landed troops. Units with flags are forming up to march up to the city gates, and he knows the city gates are getting ready to be opened, and the white, the proverbial white flag is getting ready to be raised. And he waves, and some people on the wall uh, notice him, and he says, Don't surrender! We have triumphed! And he dies of a heart attack right there, right then. But because of his message... The Athenians don't surrender. The gates are closed. The bluff fails. The Persians, they go on. Without Pheidippides, even with the victory at Marathon, the West would have been killed before it was really fully born. Because of that one man's dedication, because he literally ran himself into the ground, exploding his heart, he passed the message that saved Athens and saved our world. Never let anyone tell you that the individual does not matter. The world is changed by the dreams and willpower, choices and ideals of individuals every moment of every day. The only question is, which individuals are doing the changing? Do you neuter yourself by assuming that you're not one of the important people, you're not one of the best and brightest, you're not one of the cognoscenti, and therefore you don't really have a role in things, you'd better just follow along? Or do you, do you deny that and say, I don't care. I have ideas. They're good. I'm going to fight for them. Win or lose, I'm going to be true to myself. I'm going to have integrity. It takes guts to do that. The world will punish you for doing that. But there's no excuse for, there's nothing better.
than living with integrity, with a clean conscience. Nothing. At least so I think. So, the Battle of Marathon is won. The Persians go home, and Darius's heart is broken. His last few years are spent in frustration, trying to figure out what went wrong and come up with a new plan. And he dies a broken, angry, old man. His son Xerxes becomes emperor. Xerxes wants to avenge his father's last disappointment. He makes it his personal business to go after Greece. Now, if you want a different size of Xer side of Xerxes, read the biblical book of Esther from the Old Testament. She is a Jewish girl, woman, who has to deal with Xerxes. And she ends up doing great work for her people, saving many of her people who would otherwise have died because of an anti-Semitic uh, pogrom was, that was being planned. But by making Xerxes love her, that changed, that stopped. But in this case, Xerxes is going to come back after Greece and he is going to crush all of Greek civilization. They made his father sad. They broke his father's heart. So Xerxes gets together an army of over a half a million men. He gets together a navy bigger than anything on earth that had been seen so far, including in East Asia, which is saying something. He then takes his ships, has them lashed together to form a, a, a ship bridge, and marches his army across his fleet from Asia to Europe across the Hellespont, across the uh, channel uh, or the strait north of the Dardanelles. But there aren't enough places on these hundreds and hundreds of ships for half a million men. So what Xerxes is going to do is his army and navy are going to have to be parallel to one another. So the army and the navy are going to march on land and row at sea side by side, wherever possible. Xerxes personally is taking part in this invasion. He is taking a personal interest in it. Now, Xerxes understands about Mount Athos. Mount Athos is at the tip of this peninsula. There's a group of three peninsulas, looks like an eagle's claw. The right one has Mount Athos at the tip. And off the coast of Mount Athos is the biggest ship graveyard in all of Greece. <clears throat> there are rocks. There are shoals. There are sudden storms. <clears throat> if he tries moving <clears throat> his fleet of, of a thousand or more ships, <laughs> it could be a disaster. So he doesn't want to deal with that. He orders his army to the narrowest point in the peninsula. And they dig a canal through which the fleet will pass north of Mount Athos. The fleet goes through the land as the army went across the sea through mutual support and mutual help. It is this mutual support and mutual help that characterizes Xerxes' invasion. Xerxes is on the march and he is going to swamp Greece with Persian skill and with Persian numbers. The greatest fleet and the grandest army by land and sea are invading. <clears throat> now, Xerxes' army is heterodox and polyglot. Those are fancy ways of saying they've got dozens of different kinds of troops that continue to speak different kinds of languages. There are Palestinian Hebrew slingers who run around basically in tunics with slings like David. There are Babylonian spearmen. There are Saka and Parthian horse archers. 
there are Persian immortals. Now, immortals are not demon fiends wearing Japanese armor as shown in the movie 300. The immortals wear cloth armor. That's clothing. They have hats, not helmets, and they have wicker shields. I'll say that again. They have wicker shields. Wicker shields? Yeah. The immortals are light infantry. They are in cloth because it's easy to carry. They have wicker shields because it's easy to carry. They've got to move across the largest empire in human history by communications distance. And so they've got to be fast and they've got to have endurance. So their gear isn't that heavy. A wicker shield can catch a spear, deflect an arrow. It can do a lot of things. And I will have a picture of the Persian immortal for you to look at later. You can look online. I show it to you now, but YouTube and it's demonetized. It's, it's all sorts of stuff. I don't get monetized anyway. But YouTube would punish me because I showed a picture of a Persian immortal, even though I'm in a history class. Thank you, YouTube. Thank you. So look online tomorrow for today's lesson, and you'll see the pictures I have of the immortals. Now, why are they called the 10,000 immortals? Well, there are 10,000 of them. If they have a battle and 300 are killed, 300 replacements are immediately assigned to the immortals. If 1,200 are killed, 1,200 replacements after the battle are immediately assigned from other units to the immortals. They are immortal because the unit always goes into battle with 10,000 men. And they are the great king of Persia's own elite troops. So that's the Persian forces. The Greeks have 10 years between the uh, Marathon invasion of Darius in 490 BC and the Xerxes invasion of 480, 479 BC. What happens in those 10 years? Well, let's go to Athens, first of all. That's item B, Themistocles of Athens. Themistocles of Athens says to his people, the Persians are coming back. When they come back, they're going to come to destroy Athens. Athens showed them up. Athens was the heart of the resistance ten, you know, years ago. Athens must be destroyed for Persia to go on. It will be either Persia or Athens, not both, going into the future. So what we've got to do is prepare. Now, Athens cannot stand a siege by a real Persian army. There are too many of them. Our defenses are not nearly good enough yet. So this is what we've got to do. Southwest of Athens is the island of Salamis. The island of Salamis is unoccupied and unfortified, except for a few ships. What we do is we establish supplies of food, water, we build some forts, and what we prepare to do is empty the city of Athens when the Persians come, into onto the island of Salamis, and then our fleet will protect us. Our fleet can keep the Persian fleet at bay and until the rest of Greece moves their armies in to help us. We can't trust the walls of Athens right now. We can trust the island of Salamis. This is what we must do to survive. This is the Mystocles plan. Mystocles has enemies. And those enemies of Themistocles say, you, Themistocles, are just a warmonger! You want war! Oh, you want it so much, you're slavering for it. You want the death of Athenians. You want the burning of our city. You want war. You warmonger! And just as bad as being a warmonger, you are a defeatist! You want Athens to lose! You think if we have to go to war, the first thing we got to do is retreat, hide away on an island somewhere, like we can't fight. You warmonger! You defeatist! 
They drive him out of power. They almost drive him out of Athens because they don't like what he has to say. They want to believe in the happy dream of peace that since they drove Persia away once, Persia will never, ever, ever come back. Stupid! People are willfully self-deceptive all the time. They believe what they want, not necessarily what they should. However, Themistocles does have enough clout to make a deal with one of the two kings of Sparta. Leonidas of Sparta is a king that befriends Themistocles, and together they come up with a battle plan. The battle plan is this. Athens will empty onto Salamis Island. Whatever happens, they have to. Athens will empty onto Salamis Island. But it will take time because the Athenians have not followed the advice of Themistocles to prepare this. In order to win time, the army of Sparta will march north to a choke point. No, that's wrong. Will march north to a choke, choke point here. The Hot Gates, Thermopylae. The Hot Gates. are an area along the coast. Here's the sea. There are mountains and hills that are so rough that they channel everyone Each of these lines represents elevation into this choke point spot here. And the Spartan army will block that choke point. By blocking the choke point, they will delay the Persians long enough for Athens to empty onto Salamis and for the Athenian fleet to organize. The Athenian fleet, before it, uh, part of it and part of allied fleets, will row north to a place near the area where the island of Euboea is separate from Athens and try to block the Persian fleet so the Persian fleet can't just load their troops up and go around. It's all designed to slow the Persians down so that the Greeks don't get trapped in Athens so that the Athenians can retreat. Now, that's the plan, but it's not official because the Athenian government won't endorse it. It's unofficial. The Spartan government won't endorse it either. It's all unofficial. It's a private agreement between these two men who in wartime presumably will have power. Who will fight for the Greeks? The Greeks don't have Palestinian archers. They don't have Phoenician sailors, Babylonian spearmen, Saka archers, or Far Parthian uh, horse archers. The Greeks have one basic heavy type of troop. They're called hoplites. Not because they hop light. They're heavy infantry. Hoplites have a big, heavy, wooden, metal-reinforced shield called a hoplon. The hoplon is everything. It's so important to Spartan warfare that a seven-year-old boy leaving home to join the army has his mama say to him, Honey, sweetums, you're going off to service now. At age seven, come home with your shield or on it. In other words, honey, sweetums, little baby boy, come home victorious with your shield or come home dead carried on your shield. The shield is the heart of the Greek phalanx. The phalanx is a tightly packed, unit of foot soldiers who link shields and fight as a unit with spears and shields. The phalanx is the toughest military unit 
in the world man for man at the point of contact. And what the Greeks believe is at the point of contact, they can uh, outfight the Persians. They have what is called escalation dominance over the Persians. At the point of contact, the hoplite will uh, chew up the immortal. Now, actually, there's a picture in your notes that you can see that uh, compares the hoplite to the immortal. It's on the same page that has a picture of the Parthenon and of Pericles. You've got these two soldiers. The Persian immortal is on the right. He's wearing cloth trousers, little pointy shoes. He's got cloth armor. It looks like scale. It's really not. It's sort of, um, oh God, what do you call it? Uh, it's when you sew layers of clothing on. There's a word for it, but I don't remember. Uh, it's not metal. It's not heavy. He's got a bow, he's got a spear, and he's got a big square wicker shield. That's a, and a pointy hat. That's a Persian immortal. Light infantry. Tough guy, but not heavy gear. Compare that to the Greek. The Greek has greaves, which are shin guards made of metal. The Greek has the hoplon, the metal reinforced heavy wooden shield. The hoplon can kill. You hit somebody with a hoplon in the neck, they're going to die. He's got a sword, and he also has a spear. I don't know if he's shown with the spear. And this particular hoplite has a big frilly helmet because he's some kind of signaler or leader. The hoplon usually has decorations on it. So you have two very different types of armies. The Persians have mass on their side. They have huge numbers of people. The Greeks have very few people, but they're going to use tight spots to channel the enemy in to a spot where they can have escalation dominance, fight and win. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to show some early phases of this. As the Persian army approaches Euboea, the navy does as well. But there's a combined Greek fleet that prevents the Persian fleet from passing through the Strait of Euboea. It's called the Battle of Artemisium. 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 Therefore, the Persian fleet is blocked, and it has to go all the way around Euboea. That's going to be a problem. Meanwhile, the Spartans have plugged up the hot gates at Thermopylae. Now, we are going to see clips from a movie that is completely unhistorical, but conveys something of the spirit of that. Yes, I'm talking about the dreaded movie 300. Oh, if you like seeing almost naked male bodies ripped with muscle, straining and fighting, there is something a little about 300. But it also conveys something of the spirit. So those of you at home, I'll have a couple of clips uh, to see today that you'll watch after seeing this video. And those of you who are here who are going are to see them live. Thank you.